So tonight I'm going to jump over to our slides and begin to discuss all of the aspects of what we're doing and how that influences you as an artist. So technology is changing the game. That is the fundamental element that we really find. And technology has always changed the game. When we go back to the old record players and Victrolas that we had with the wind-up cranks, to 12-inch uh, vinyls and 33 and a third to 45s. And then we moved, of course, to things like cassette tapes. And we had those number two pencils, which actually we referred to them as the cassette winders. Uh, we, of course, found ourselves moving to 8-tracks and certainly the Walkman and finally moving over into things like CDs and, and the very first streaming service in uh, Napster, which ultimately fell away as the copyright laws were prosecuted. And today we really have all sorts of streaming platforms, but more than that, we have a whole series of elements of consumption that become important. So what are we going to talk about tonight? Well, we're going to talk about the industry at large. You know, what's happening? What's driving some of those changes? And how does that influence you as an artist? You know, the old days of just playing your music, just putting it out there, and, and as I said, writing a great song with a great musicianship is insufficient today to build a career. And it's why so many artists, because of the competition, because frankly the market itself, so many artists have their day jobs and then their art is presented in the evening. But there is the opportunity to make a living at this. But you have to understand both the technological changes that are occurring and ultimately who your fans are. And then finally, how do you monetize your specific capabilities in your music? We'll look at those changes in the context of what your expectations have typically been. And I've talked to a lot of artists now. I've spent hours and hours as I've onboarded people, talked through some of the issues on our own technology that we're supplying. And the, the feedback and the sense I get from a lot of artists is, you know, we want to have fun. We want to make music. We want to present ourselves. We want to earn a living at this. But it's more difficult than we thought it was. <laughs> and certainly it is even more difficult given the market changes that are occurring. So I'm going to provide some of these key insights into the technologies, but I'm also going to talk to the market at large. And then really the idea of how a lot of artists today are independent, going it alone, so to speak. Those who are using independent small labels to help them. And of course, the, the very significant few that ultimately are able to actually be brought on board by a large label like Columbia or Universal or others. And as we see that that is a certainly rarefied space uh, today. So what are some of the industry trends in 2022? Well, the media and entertainment really saw these continued changes, and most importantly, a lot of that was driven by COVID, right? We saw the technology prog progress during those uh, last almost two years of shutdown. We eliminated a great deal of live performance. Streaming became a critical element. People were struggling perhaps with doing live streams on Facebook or attempting to use some of the other technologies. There were generational behaviors that were evolving. We saw changes in how the older people who consume technology, people like myself and music generally, have moved away from some of those traditional, sense, traditional ways in which we consumed music to the younger folks who today basically, just as they're flipping through a dating app, will flip through singles. The idea of releasing an album, as it certainly was traditional in my, life, in my day, you would listen to it from the front to the back. In fact, in Cleveland, Ohio, where I grew up, we had one of the very first FM stations, WMMS, which when an album was played, was played in its entirety, both front and back. And the idea was to give you a sense of that entire artistry. And, of course, you all recall opening those vinyl sleeves and reading the specific uh, literature and or the, the, the actual uh, uh, detail around the song, who the artists were, who wrote it, and in fact the lyrics themselves. Today we have things like lyric videos. Today we have much more content being presented. And amongst all this COVID-19 surge, a lot of people became very concerned. Digital media became more important. People had their face down in their phones. They were using their computers more effectively. We had entirely new technologies evolve with the likes of Zoom and certainly Microsoft meetings and many, many others who heretofore were not used as extensively as they are today. And not only do we see that accelerating change in the way 
we communicated with one another, but then we also found that the various consumers' behaviors also changed as we saw trends occur in the industry generally, and more importantly, as we saw the consumer of specific content, that is music, also became the purveyor of that content. We'll talk about that as well. And then lastly, there's this whole idea of socioeconomic changes. What occurred and what is occurring relative to the younger users of music, the younger consumers? And the question the artist has to say is just as we have a, a finite resource of money, the consumer of, of games, of music, of other media has a finite capability of time. And therefore, the artist today not only has to answer the question is, is my music good? Is my song good? Am I doing the right thing by distribution? But more importantly, why? Why should that consumer give me time, time that they have of their budget to listen to me? So we'll talk more about that as well. Deloitte Consulting talks about five major trends I'm going to talk very really few about. Streaming video industry is maturing, and we're seeing a lot of that. You know, Iron Gate Records has done a deal. We're actually using uh, the folks of Restream IO. They have a very compelling value proposition. Not only is it multi-platform streaming, but multi-platform uh, communications for messaging, etc. It also has the capability, for instance, to provide a centralized uh, studio console that can allow artists or other users of the technology to be remote and therefore appear to be a single show. We're seeing that the metrics of the industry are also maturing. So they talk a lot about how these business models evolving and in-person entertainment, of course, which heretofore had gone away during the uh, impact of COVID, now are, are beginning to change and venues are beginning to open, but they're opening with other restrictions. And more recently, we're seeing a bit of loosening to all of those. But nonetheless, there's a greater pressure now to simply go beyond getting people out of their cocoons, the pandemic cocoon, so to speak, and begin identifying how we can differentiate ourselves from just the living room. And live music has the ability to do that. I think a very interesting event last night, if those of you who watched the Super Bowl, I was actually driving, so I was listening to it, but halftime, they had a number of the hip-hop artists, but in all cases, those artists were backed by live musicians, live drums, live guitars, live bass, and other elements of musical instruments and players to not only assist those hip-hop legends, but also, more importantly, to provide a compelling reason to watch. You can imagine had that been just certainly uh, the artists, Mary J. Bilge, just singing with a computer in the background. Nobody watches that. So there is a real element here of understanding how music is consumed and, more importantly, how you as the artist can present your craft in a way that ultimately is more appreciated by the consumer of those elements. Social media, very interesting, is, is moving beyond the traditional Facebook, now meta, the metaverse, right? But what is interestingly, uh, what is interesting, I should say, about the entirety of social media is we're going well beyond that in the sense that the social media brands are now becoming the distribution channels for music and content. So things like, for instance, YouTube Music, right? As, as, as Google moved away from Google Play, integrating the elements of video and the former content related to YouTube exclusively now presents the music itself. We're seeing the next generation of acquisition of everything from retail shopping to distribution occur. Interestingly enough, and one of the things we're going to be adding in our services is the impact of NFTs and bringing more uh, scarcity to elements of creation that can be bought and sold, uh, that can be monetized. Uh, of course, we're seeing a lot more digital product innovation. Uh, the creators, in particular, are realizing that not only can they use the artist's songs, as in TikTok, for instance, but they create an entire new element around those songs. So the consumer now becomes the content creator. And in addition, we're seeing a larger realization of how monetization occurs today. More importantly, things like blockchain technology and cryptocurrency. We're seeing alternative ways in which trades occur. A good example, of course, is the fact that Bitcoin and some of the other 
cryptocurrencies are being bought and sold in the market no longer as strict investments, but are in fact being used to buy and sell various elements within the web and the decentralized web in particular. So we have to consider all of these elements as we go forward as an artist and in fact how these demographic changes and financial changes and finally technology changes are impacting what heretofore was music, songs, vocals, and instruments. Now streaming still drives the music of course, we know that because, as we said, 60,000 new songs a day on Spotify alone. When you look at this graph, however, what's very interesting is there is a, a, a change, a small change, occurring relative to physical media. So when you look at specifically the area of vinyl, for instance, there actually has been an increase in total vinyl sales. And the reason is that there is a sense to a throwback uh, not only to heretofore old days, quote unquote, but more importantly to the element of having a a piece of history or a piece of your artist's art in your hands, which is not possible to do in streaming. And so we're seeing, for instance, uh, you know, over in this case, twenty-five billion dollars of market. And you can see we went strictly from physical distribution now down to about five billion dollars. But we also saw the change in more importantly, uh, streaming grow much more rapidly. And so streaming itself is not going away, but it is beginning to change, and the distributors of streaming are, interestingly enough, are also beginning to change. There is, however, an element in particular for live shows or for artists who are certainly producing new content or even reissuing some of their old content to go harken back to those vinyl 12-inch records that we had in the past. So where does the power lie, you have to ask yourself? And this is an important element for artists. Well, you know, Facebook and Instagram really have a very little media focus. In fact, Instagram was playing around with some of their uh, video content. Uh, they've now moved away from that. They've integrated long-style long videos into the core postings, so you no longer have a separate uh, component of the Instagram. Uh, Instagram still, in my opinion today, is a relatively poor uh, technology for the promotion of your of your brand because you can't link anything to it, although that is beginning to change. We're going to be seeing the ability to link your Facebook account and some of your posts to, for instance, your merchandise shop. Facebook is continuing to evolve towards meta, but it is still not an area where you go to seek out music. You don't go to Facebook to find the next great artist. We use it to promote ourselves. We use it to promote the artist. And we use it, of course, to communicate with followers. But the stronger focus is on those areas of what's happening now in the other social media, like TikTok and Vertigo and Line Music and YouTube, as I mentioned, where we are now taking the music that the providers, not the providers, but the artists are providing and distributing and using that in creating new content, new innovative content. Regrettably, Regrettably, in particular with TikTok, uh, the notion of making money on your music that is being used by another content provider who perhaps has a million views of a particular uh, TikTok, you only get paid on one view, one time. And so the challenge, of course, is that how do you turn those million views, potentially hearing your music, into fandom that actually follow you? And then finally, of course, we have the strong music focus and, and weaker on the social media. Probably, I think when you look at Spotify, they've done a much better job of integrating sort of an element of social media, that is finding out about your artist, the about page, et cetera, than some of the others. But nonetheless, they're still behind. So you have in this area to the right of this graph the ability to sort of bring more of the social, more of the interaction with your consumer of music, and the ability to bring more social function in the actual music distributors themselves. And so we're going to see, I think, over the coming months and perhaps even a couple of years, changes in this graph where perhaps there will be a move of the traditional music focus streaming on the bottom right-hand quadrant up into the more social focus and vice versa. And so the social focus will maybe enhance their music offerings as well. And this is all beginning to happen as 
these demographic changes occur, and more importantly, as the winners and losers of the various social media fall out. I mentioned, though, album buyers keep it old school, and that's very interesting because there were 40.6 million units produced last year, uh, which is enormous in the, in the total of, of uh, LP sales and CD sales, or 40, I'm sorry, almost 42 million. Um, CDs are still being sold. Digital, of course, downloads are actually still occurring, but by, by comparison to overall streaming volume, they are relatively small total numbers of units. And so when we think about these vehicles by which album sales occur, either CD or, or LPs or even some digital downloads, it's really being in, in, engaged in the, the uh, fan vis-a-vis -vis your merchandise sales at your shows. And for those artists who frankly have a, a great legacy or have an extraordinary catalog, they are reissuing some of their greatest music and even some of their new music on LPs, for instance, and putting them out into distribution to storefronts. And that is a channel that one has to look at over time, particularly as artists grow and, and are able to uh, sell those additional LPs, so to speak, not only while they're performing, but also potentially through retail distribution. So what about this metaverse? You know, we've all heard about uh, Facebook moving over to meta. And Zuckerberg tells us all about the metaverse and how we're all going to be living virtually and how we're all going to have glasses on our head. Well, the truth of the matter is that there's a lot of investment going on, but there's not a lot of adoption. The reality is it's more hype than reality. And I think at the end of the day, while the metaverse is an interesting concept, there is still the element of tethering yourself to a computer or another product, and ultimately how is the content being created that, quote-unquote, the metaverse provides. I will also say that the metaverse is still virtual, and so one continues to win out with the actual live performance over the virtual performance. Now, those lines over time will blur, and I'm sure you've all read about some of these uh, scientists who suggest that we're already living in a matrix, that in fact mankind is just a computer program. I don't happen to believe that myself. However, I think creators no longer see streaming as the end point. And this is a, a very, very critical idea, that as you begin to build out your capabilities as an artist, it's not just about producing the song. It's about managing the entire interaction across this technology architecture we're building in the various social media components, certainly in the way music is distributed, as I mentioned, and the way content is created and content is consumed. And so we're going to see some change in the way not only music gets monetized, but the way ultimately it emerges alongside streaming. And I think the key here is rights versus monetization. So in other words, how does big tech drive a greater share of revenue today uh, and how are the small-time creators competing against big tech? Big tech isn't always the answer, and we're seeing that where today TikTok, for instance, actually has more views than Google. It is a larger uh, number of eyeballs per day than any of the other legacy big tech creators. So there is the opportunity for disruption, and by integrating what you're doing in a broader set of technologies, you potentially can prepare yourself for those changes that ultimately will continue and come further. Now, on a macro level, very interestingly, we see these fintech startups, like Square, for instance, having purchased Tidal. Uh, Tidal, of course, is the uh, startup uh, streaming company that was begun by Jay-Z and Beyonce. And you ask yourself, why does a financial services company like Square decide to buy a music streaming company? Well, the actual answer may be in the sense that not only does Square provide financial transactions, but they provide financial transactions at scale. And they have an enormous captured market of users and user data that they can begin to mine and present other offerings to, music being one of those. So while they are monetizing that content, vis-a-vis -vis understanding who their users are of the traditional financial services element of Square, they've now begun to expand their service offering. And this is one of those changes that we may see more of. In fact, while it's 
relatively a nascent initiative and new, the reality is M&A activity uh, is still going on and will probably accelerate. You, you certainly saw the fact that in the past year, for instance, we've seen a lot of uh, sales of, of music catalogs, for instance, um, several hundred million dollars. We've seen uh, many, many bands who have sold all of their catalog to a major distributor and ultimately are now integrating that into broader services around things like distribution into movies, commercials, and other elements, while the artist pockets 100, 200, or 300 million dollars for their life work. Uh, and this is why also one of the things that I tell my artists all the time, which is critically important, is that you need to own your content. You need to own your, your absolute masters. You need to own your copyrights, you and or your folks that you collaborate with in writing. Because ultimately, in the long term, that may, and I use the word may, if it's good enough, may be worth much more than the money you make over uh, distribution alone. Certainly, even perhaps more than you make through concerts or performance. Because ultimately, the acquisition role that we're talking about here is billions of dollars. And I think, as I mentioned, so as we see these changes in the social media uh, as well as in the financial services side, there's been changes in the fan. So when we look at the left side of this uh, graphic, the traditional mode of, of development was, you know, I'm going to write a song, I'm going to record my song, and then I'm going to sell my song. And so that's great. It was the old model, and ultimately we saw things begin to change as what we talk about is uh, lean in. In other words, from the point of view of simply waiting and selling your wares, quote unquote, to now have a, a relationship with the fan vis-a-vis -vis subscriptions or your distribution of material. Uh, they may follow you more directly. They ultimately are using other technologies and, and live streaming. And uh, they also will buy merchandise while they're online watching an event. Live betting is a good example. We saw here again with the advent of this recent uh, Super Bowl, one of the most enormous growth in live online betting that they've ever seen in the history. And this again is one other element that is vying for the consumer's attention. And so as we go forward to the idea of lean out, what do we mean by that? Well, specifically, the fan now is actually making the content. So anytime you go to the... Uh, TikTok, you see many, many pieces of music being used. I will also tell you that Iron Gate Records and its association with uh, Intercept and, of course, Universal Music Group, any of the distribution that occurs through our channel ultimately is whitelisted on TikTok and can be used by fans to create content. And, of course, in the end, while you don't get paid uh, anything significant on that, much like you get paid very little on streaming, your music, however, can be distributed to potentially thousands or hundreds of thousands of new fans. But the other ele element to watch here is that as that content gets presented, presented to the consumer, the consumer themselves is making decisions every moment of the day about what songs they're going to listen to, what shows they're going to watch, what component of perhaps sports they're going to participate in, what gaming they're going to create or be part of, how they're going to interact across that virtual social relationship in their various uh, uh, online uh, accounts, and then ultimately how they're going to purchase everything from food to, to that media to merchandise. And so the artist now has to think about the consumer in a broader sense that music specifically and art, the artist's content and more importantly the artist's presentation of that content vis-a-vis -vis, um, performances has to vie for the amount of time necessary for that consumer to pay attention. So it's no longer, as I said, good enough just to write a great song. Um, a good example in the country music was uh, certainly um, a, a few years ago when we saw uh, country music stars move more towards the pop genre, right? Uh, Garth Brooks was an example 
of adding a show. He became the showman within country music. It wasn't simply getting up on stage and performing, but it was an entirety of a show that made him the premier performer for many, many years. And so as a particular uh, user, a particular performer, understanding the implications of these changes is important, and it is going to become more complex, not less complex. And so when I talk about the idea of you're vying for the time budget of that consumer, you need to, of course, at a minimum, put out great music. You need to distribute all your music to all the channels you possibly can, and then you need to perform your music in a manner that becomes compelling to the consumer. And this is also important because at times we see, and I'm certain those of you have played, I've certainly watched this occur in, in some of the bookings I've done, we see that the musician simply becomes music. And this is really an unfortunate situation because all too often the venue is worried about selling $5 beers and the musician behind is simply playing music to a crowd that is, quote unquote, using it as an ambiance. Uh, ambiance uh, for the actual venue and therefore the question you have to ask is is that performer compelling is that performer engaging is that performer presenting something that that consumer who is at that moment in time perhaps enjoying their friends enjoying that beer will they pay attention and so as a performer you always have to ask that question what can I do to improve not only my my music and my art, but also how do I present that to my consumers? And of course, you know, I talked about this idea of legacy of uh, music to the digital model. You know, traditionally studios, and, and this is still the case in some artists' mind, we want to go to this great studio. We want to uh, ultimately record at this studio because it's got a history of recording certain artists that we've heard about. But the technology has changed so rapidly and because distribution now happens through a handful of channels that the development of what I call perfection should not, or should, I should say the development of good should not be inhibited by perfection. Uh, in other words, perfection not, should not be the enemy of good. And there is sufficient capabilities in technology, sufficient capabilities in terms of recording that most artists can get a very good product before distribution. It relies on, of course, the editing, the mixing, and the mastering of that music before distribution happens. The other thing that was perhaps legacy approach, people would generate an entire album and release the album. And for many, many years, that was the standard. But today, when you release that album, it goes out as one hit on Spotify. And therefore, to promote that entirety of that album becomes most difficult. Whereas the current model, if you will, is to reduce or to, re to release those singles every six to eight weeks so that you're hitting the algorithm, algorithms at Spotify and other distribution models, and you're ultimately being able to promote that song, perhaps catch fire on that song, and perhaps go viral on that song. Uh, and I think that in the end, you know, we're finding that localization also becomes important. So, for instance, we're seeing in America still with rap being a predominant and hip-hop being predominant music genres, overtaking country and overtaking uh, rock, uh, certainly. <clears throat> but interestingly enough, in Europe, it is not the case. And so Europe distribution, there's a great more interest in live music in a broader live musical instrument in listening habits. And so we're finding, for instance, in my own experience with some of our artists, a greater uptake in the international markets because they wish to hear more of a broader uh, musical element rather than the beats of a hip hop or, or a, a rap artist. And in particular, as it relates to the complexity of music versus oftentimes the simplicity of those beats. And then finally, you have, in fact, even the localization. We see K-pop in Korea, for instance, becoming very popular, or Latin music, and even Indian hip-hop, where it has a element of the uh, social demographic related to that music, and so you have to consider that as well. And finally, I think at the end of the day here, it's really about being a lean artist. You know, <laughs> the traditional notion that he completes releases and licenses the music, and then somebody else turns that musical content to drive engagement. And a lot of us saw that in the early stages of 
of uh, TikTok, right? You would see a particular song that was playing in the background. Oftentimes, you would see somebody dancing to it or doing some dance moves. Today, you're seeing it as background music as well. And, and oftentimes, you would see perhaps a particular song go viral. Well, that's also something that's changing. Today, TikTok has over a billion users, over one billion users. And so the idea of virality or a viral nature of music or a viral nature of a particular TikTok is diminished markedly because the, the entirety of the TikTok uh, population is so much larger. And while viral songs still do occur, they occur at much less frequency, or viral TikToks, I should say, they occur at much less frequency than before. And that's really because of the fact that we're now seeing such a large population of users, and that large population of users has so much to consume or so much to decide. And using those algorithms, for instance, in TikTok, about what you like or what you don't like automatically begins to limit the things that you're presented with. And so that, again, is an area where I've heard people talk. You know, I want a, I want a viral TikTok. Well, the reality is you're probably not going to get one anymore, and unless it's something quite unique. And one of the things you also see on TikTok in particular is a lot of repetition, right? You see a lot of people doing the same thing over and over again. It's when somebody that does something different, when somebody creates a different idea, that it becomes more interesting. And, of course, YouTube as the quote-unquote channel to monetize has itself begun to change. Um, the reality is that it's not good enough to just simply have a, a particular uh, music video out there, although music videos are still popular. But the challenge is how do you get people to watch it? Your channel has to create something new. Your channel has to be engaging on a different level. You don't simply put up a piece of music video and say, come watch me. There is other reasons, and so there is a personalization that has to occur between the artist the, uh, and the consumer. And as I said, the consumer is becoming the creator now. So whether it's gamers how many of you have seen certainly online gaming, just people watching? There are entire communities watching a gamer record his or her gaming and presenting it to a myriad people who want to see that gamer who happens to have a particular talent for Fortnite or some other uh, game and is able to do really well with that and then simply records their playing of the game. We have a whole group of consumers who are now watching and not participating. And so why are they watching? Well, because there's so much compelling content out there. And so just as we saw in the Super Bowl with millions of people watching the game between two teams, it's no different in the virtual world. Millions of people watching somebody that they're interested in, some component of music, some component of gaming, some component of, of uh, video creation, all of which, by the way, is competing for that consumer's eyeballs. And in the early days of the web, we used to talk about gaining eyeballs on a website. Today, you're now trying to get eyes and ears and creativity using all of that content to generate sort of that other interest. And I think that is extremely interesting as we go forward here 2022 20, and beyond. As I mentioned, virality is losing its impact. As I mentioned, there's over a billion users now, and 20% of consumers use TikTok weekly. And in fact, TikTok overall um, is, you know, indexed for everything listening to Spotify. It's beating many of the other uh, platforms that are out there. But the media landscape is truly saturated. And we go back to that very early comment I made about 60,000 music uh, releases alone on Spotify each and every single day. And so what does it mean to be viral or what does it mean to be mainstream tends to lose its impact. And it's frustrating for an artist. It's certainly frustrating for me as a label to think about how do I help the artist uh, overcome that inertia of the market? How do I help the artist begin to evolve a marketing plan that allows them to place bets judiciously? Remember, as an artist, oftentimes you're spending one, two, or three thousand dollars to produce a particular song, depending on your live music and overdubs and time and space for recording as well as editing, mix, and mastering, and then finally distributing it. 
And at the same time, I find that some artists do all that work, throw it out via some distribution arm within a week, and expect something magical to happen. That is simply not the case and simply will not occur anymore. And so when you con contemplate your music, when you contemplate how you promote that music, one still has to think about ultimately what the economic investment is over time. And this is why, going back to my earlier comment, it is the ability to be good enough but not perfect and to be able to integrate a marketing plan within the context of your release. And so the strategy, the strategy becomes an all of the above. We've heard that, I think, during the last uh, 2020 election, right? Building out our energy reserves is really an all of the above strategy. And just as we saw the move from 8-tracks to cassettes to CDs to the iPod and all the way through to Spotify, technology is going to continue to change. And so the artists need that help. And when you integrate into an independent label that has a good technology backbone, and many of them do not, because I also discovered in my research and in working with other labels that many, many people, frankly, are not interested in technology. They are either fearful of it or they don't want to learn it. But if you think about this, in the case of uh, some of the technology we use, they have literally tens of thousands of artists and or other users in that platform. And they are taking advantage of all that content and all that understanding and all that perspective across all those various artists to build out the next iteration of that infrastructure, to build out the next iteration of that functionality. And what that means is you as an artist, by aligning yourself with a technology-driven label, can be more efficient ultimately in distribution, perhaps have greater opportunity for success, but more importantly, to recoup that which you invest in your own music and time, to actually monetize that and to be able to make money. We, we have a case study on our website at Iron Gate Records that talks about one particular uh, uh, artist, Ikapu, who uh, spent approximately $1,800, and through his streams and through uh, a loan, he was able to recoup over $3,000 against that initial spend. But more importantly, he generated nearly, you know, a million new uh, Instagram followers, over a million new contacts in his uh, Facebook co uh, connections, and lastly, over a million uh, plays of his, of his uh, music. And so one has to think about, is that always going to be the case? Of course not. But ultimately, those things are possible, and therefore one has to consider as they build out this overall strategy that ultimately you have to consider the total economics of a release of a particular song. It confounds me oftentimes as I think about some artists, they'll want to release that song a week after getting it produced and, and it sounds great, but they do nothing to actually create an entire social media strategy. Something, by the way, that takes time, but that they could do for free, but do nothing around that because they can't either be bothered or they don't like to do it. And as a result, there's a there's a wasting of all that value that was created in the studio and ultimately distributed by virtue of not taking advantage of some of these channels. And that I'm not talking about strictly advertising. I'm talking about being able to use those social media channels effectively. And then lastly, I want to talk about this idea of a black swan event. Those of you who perhaps are in finance may know that. What, what occurs next that we can't anticipate? You know, Apple iTunes was like the number one seller of online music for the longest time. In fact, everybody probably had an iPod at some point or an iPod Nano. They bought their music and downloaded it, had their catalogs. And it would appear that Apple, while today still moving aggressively in streaming, sort of missed the boat. We had a complete new competitor in the Spotify come up, grow more rapidly, build out their customer base, build a more social um, type of inter interaction with the fan base and for the musicians and built, frankly, I believe, a better user interface, a user experience. And yet a $3 trillion company, which today does so many things well, missed, I believe, to some degree the boat of the traditional streaming platform. So those black swan events, those things that we don't expect to happen are still going to happen even in the music business. We don't know where that's going, but we hope it goes in a positive way. And I think that as I'm Looking at the market at large, I believe that you know there is beginning to be a turn towards 
music as being more of a communal activity. In other words, people want to be around the musicians, want to hear live music, want to enjoy that. And I think that's partly driven by the fact that we're coming out of this pandemic, becoming an endemic, and people are becoming more used to what's occurring there. So ultimately, collaboration becomes the leverage point here. As the technology changes, you, are, you cannot invest, nor can I invest and buy all that technology myself. I can't create multiple software companies. Uh, we've done that through our strategic alliances and through the subscription agreements that we establish, and we leverage that shared learning more efficiently. Uh, you know, individualism in the music is your own sound, but it doesn't preclude collaboration. In other words, the idea to work with other artists or to work with other writers and to build your catalog around that collaboration becomes important. We see that today in many artists who are much more mature, mature and successful. They'll bring a particular uh, artist on board to collaborate with them versus, let's say, in a pop music with perhaps a hip-hop artist or a country music artist uh, with a rap artist. And we saw that occur with uh, Naz, I believe, uh, recently and certainly that was a one example of that that was very effective. Um, the record labels, you know, ultimately help the artist, but they are not managing all the myriad changes either because the big labels, my experience and my reading of the market, have their, I guess what I'll call it, their, their, their uh, stable of their qualified or quality performers that they protect. And so the idea of jumping in on a big record deal, deal is less likely to occur today than it was in the past. Nobody's writing million dollar checks. And if they are, it's because you've already got the social media in place, you've already got the fans in place, you've already got the streaming in place, and you've already been out there performing your music regularly to a large fan base. And so you are already there when they come to you and say, come on board. And when you come on board all too often, if you don't have that next hit, you're sidelined. Or they do a deal where they own your catalog, even potentially some of your preceding catalog. So there is a much more important element here that as artists, to find yourself to collaborate with the right independent label or other artists, to own your content, to own your intellectual property, to maintain that throughout your career. And you can do that today at a relatively low cost while also taking advantage of many of these trends I've been describing. And by integrating this technology, it allows you to not only institutionalize that shared experience across all those providers, but more importantly, you as the artist can go back to focusing on your content while considering the way in which you present your art, the way in which you interact with your fans, and the things that you must learn and you must begin to convey in those activities which go beyond writing, recording, and distributing. That in the is, I guess at the end of the day, what I refer to as the collaboration uh, circle across all those elements we've been describing. So the final question you have to ask yourself is, are labels still relevant? And of course they are, because many of the labels today are expanding. They're buying these catalogs. They're, they're building so many different uh, capabilities. They have enormous money to do so. The small guys tend to sit down there like mice around the elephants. But in the end, that small label, that independent, really is oftentimes better than going it alone, as long as you understand that you as the artist hold the power in that decision-making process, that you as the artist ultimately are the benefit, benefactor of your own content. Because in the end, if you chase a record deal, um, you as the artist may have to give up too much, and that is unnecessary in today's world. And so does anyone have the answer in 100% today? Does anyone, uh, can they tell you exactly what you should do to be successful? Well, there are those in the industry who record pop songs in particular, and they will tell you it has to have this type of beat, it has to have this type of musical content, it has to have this type of vocals, and we find that over time, and I certainly have discovered this as I've listened to more music today, they begin to sound all alike. And for me as a listener, uh, when I talk about how much of my time I'm going to give, I'm not going to give my time to things that sound the same. I want an organic element. I want a uniqueness to music. In the old days, when recordings took place, we didn't have click tracks. Now, you're not going to get away from a click track today, 
But in the old days, there was that sitting on the back feet or on the front feet, and people were oftentimes just off one another, but it made the music interesting. And so this is why I said perfection uh, is and can be the enemy of good. And so the idea of live music in particular and the ability to play that which you record so you sound like you sound on the record or the recording in live environments also is important. And so the rep record label really can do a few good things for you. <clears throat> it can make your music sound better by tying you into the right sort of producer and the right recording environment, uh, the public relations and your image. We talk about consistency, and I have discovered, you know, all sorts of things like many different names for musicians. They're not using the same um, URL on their websites that they are in their Facebook page that they are in their YouTube page, so they're not able to leverage that effectively. Obviously, distribution becomes important, and in particular, as in Iron Gate, we are directly aligned with the Universal Music Group through Intercept. Um, you know, obviously, my hope and dream for my independent label is I won't strike it rich, but the artists will strike it rich. In other words, ultimately, they can make it big, and they may find that they don't have to go to a big label once they've been successful. And finally, Iron Gate and many other independent labels, as long as they pre present themselves in a unique way, can also provide you with a level of credibility. But in the end, in my humble opinion as a technology guy, if a record label isn't using technology effectively to deliver these services, it is not going to be a, a record label that you want to ultimately do business with because they will be oftentimes doing a series of one-offs or they'll have to repeat the process so many times as to be inefficient, and therefore there will be a tendency to either have economic uh, expenditures that are not beneficial to you, or more importantly, there is no way to capture the shared learning that ultimately occurs through the work you're doing because there is no way to institutionalize that in the technology, whereas uh, understanding your social media content, understanding your fan base, understanding other people's fan bases, recognizing what venues you should be playing at. All those sorts of things can be created in the technology platform and be used by the artists and therefore be much more efficient in delivering those services. So Iron Gate really begins to address all these things through our technology platform. You know, it's first of all to provide this business framework. And I've shared this with many of you. You know, I started Iron Gate Records after managing my son's band for almost five years and recognizing after going through a, a record deal that the kind of things that I would have expected from my own quote-unquote son by these services was not being uh, effectively delivered. And I found that a lot of times that um, there was not clarity, there was not transparency in either the economics or in the way services would be delivered. And so Iron Gate, in creating it after writing the business plan and sharing that with my co-founder, Greg Upchurch from Three Doors Down, you know, was really to deliver this broad array of services like I wanted to deliver to my son and his band to my other artists. So in other words, to create a community that was based on a broad array of services that could be delivered very, very efficiently at a known cost, and then to provide, like we do when you shop at Amazon or other sites, a series of elective services that would be bought at cost with a simple markup that you would know as an artist and create a budget. And therefore, you know what you're going to spend when you spend it, and you mitigate much of the cost and risk factors of not knowing, quote, unquote, what's in there when you sign a contract. And that last element really is that all of our technology gets uh, enabled through those services, uh, what I call high tech and high touch, to the artist relationship. So and essentially by providing this technology framework, we can integrate that more closely into the artist. And as new services roll out through those technology platforms, the artist has access to those almost immediately. And for the artist, that becomes a very important tool for them to be able to not only manage their careers, but manage many of the dynamics I've been talking about during this whole presentation. And I guess that the last component here really is that not only do we focus on our technology partners, focus on those building of those relationships, but we begin to dialogue with the CEOs of those companies, the tech uh, representatives of those companies, to figure out how best to deliver those services to our artists and to do so effectively. And in my humble opinion, that is uh, 
really uh, one of the biggest benefits ultimately to, uh, to what Iron Gate presents. And we do all that on basically a 30-day out contract. In other words, we don't need to be married to you. We just want to work with you. And if the artist isn't happy or we're not happy, we can go our separate ways. Of course, ultimately you, you lose access to technology. That's for sure. But in the end, you still own all of your content. You own your masters. You own your documents. And anything that you co-write with us, obviously, is a much more traditional distribution contract. And so what we've done is taken this whole services model from the top of the clock at noon, artist development, through to distribution, to social media management, the analytics, marketing, booking and tour management, video performance and streaming, and ultimately publishing and, and affinity management and the financial services. And we've worked with four key technology providers where we have strategic partnerships in our model with Intercept at the A&R side, GigWell for touring and gig management, repertoire for our publishing, and then Restream for, for the uh, aspect of our uh, uh, streaming services. <laughs> and what's beginning to occur now is the ability, ultimately, as we build this entire wheel of functionality and services, is to begin to understand how all those services are linked to the artist and their lifestyle. In other words, the affinity management really becomes, in the, in the Instagram world, it's talking about influencers. How do you get paid for presenting, perhaps, you, to your fan base uh, a particular clothing product or a particular music product or a lifestyle product so that you can ultimately earn money on the basis of your broad reach and your influence as an artist. And that is the sort of holy grail of creating what I like to say is that mailbox money beyond what you do in the core competency of, of distribution of your recording and, and your music itself, your performance of your music, your publishing itself, and, and of course the way you present your music. So in the end, this is our core model. It's no magic, but ultimately it is surprising to me how many uh, independent labels do not present themselves in this context, either A, because they're afraid of the technology, or B, want to sort of present themselves as being quote-unquote experts that you as the artist could never understand, and therefore, ultimately, um, uh, you have to do business with them while they sort of do everything behind the curtain. We're transparent. Because in the end, there is no magic. It's a lot of hard work. And even if we have all these capabilities, and you as the artist don't do the hard work to get a great song, write a great song, record a great song, and ultimately do the kind of work that's necessary to promote that song, to perform that song, and to engage with your various fans, you cannot be as successful as the artist who might do otherwise. And so one of the things we continue to do is liaise with our artists, be accessible to artists, and ultimately engage them in those conversations. So in the end, you own your IP, you own all your masters, you subscribe to our services with a low, uh, a low monthly fee, you use our templates to add services that meet your budget, you have a single contract with a 30-day out clause, and you have to be a legitimate talent and ready to work. We don't just bring anybody on board because we want a, a warm body. If we're not, through our A&R people, not interested in your music and you're not a good artist, and you're not producing good music, we really don't want you on the label. And But on the other hand, we provide you the support from the labels they and our services. We present your profile across all of our social media and website. We integrate your content within our technology architecture to enable our services. We will deliver those new services as our technology providers roll them out in the roadmaps. And we help you to meet your demands of an ever-changing market, ultimately by doing things like we're doing tonight with this webinar and the research that we do. So I appreciate your time. I appreciate all of you listening in, and uh, as I said, we're going to present this uh, recording at the end, and I'm going to now uh, just come out of the uh, webinar, and I'll uh, turn this over, and I think we can probably take some questions in a moment. If you just give me a second, we've just got to connect our mouse once again, since it's kind of gone.